So what we're going to do, we're going to learn cost-benefit analysis by just doing one. All right, it's kind of my radical approach. So <clears throat> we've done discounted cash flows. You remember how you did time value money? You had a cash flow in the future, and you discounted it to today by dividing by one plus a rate to time. We're going to do that, but we're going to let Bill Gates do it for us using some functions in Excel to make it much easier to handle. This is a very good real life case. This is a thing, <clears throat> this is a problem I actually had at USAA. The uh, Treasury Management Department of the Property and Casualty Company came and said they had this problem. We talked about it last class, but they have these really manual bill bills that are coming to them. A lot of errors, very time consuming, and they want to see, hey, can, can we convert these electronically? And so we walked through all of that. So what you want to do in your Excel, so let me just show you the Excel setup. You want to have your first sheet be your introduction. You want to make sure when someone loads your analysis that they know exactly what this spreadsheet is doing. That's for all Excel. It doesn't have to just be a cost benefit analysis. Uh, I, I did some projects in my career where um, I, I remember one, it was, I thought it was a one-time question, so I answered it, built the model, gave them the answer, and six months later they, they asked, can you update that? I'm going, wait, I don't even know what I named the file. And so I load the file, I have no idea what I did. I essentially had to start up from scratch. If I just made some notes, it would have made my life a whole lot easier. So even if you think it's a one-time analysis, at least document. So how do you do that? Well, if you want to, um, you can definitely create uh, merge cells. Y'all know how to merge cells? You do Alt, HMC. Y'all know how to do that? Just Alt. I don't know how to do it on a Mac, so your Mac may not. So what I'm going to do, so what you can do with your case um, you'll be doing stuff in Word. You can take some of the stuff in Word and copy and paste in here. Let me just show you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to take this. It's going to be too much, but that's all right. I'm going to take this and just take it into Excel and just paste it in Excel just so I have it all there. Uh, on your cell application, I'm not real picky on this little part. Have something just shows what it is, but find some way to summarize it. It might be a little much to have all that in there. So I might be able to uh, <coughs> shorten this down some. But anyway, something, when people come in, the first thing they'd see is what is the Excel spreadsheet about? What is the project? <laughs> One thing that really helped here is just make the text a lot smaller so I can actually read it. So that's a little overkill for your projects, one or two paragraphs maybe, or maybe in two or three sentences that just says, what are you doing? And make it really, really clear what your problem is. So if you're trying to decide between buying a car or using shared services, just make it really, really clear that we're trying to decide between buying a car in this price range versus using rideshare. You know, make it really, really clear what you're trying to do. And in that case, we said, your decision is, do I buy the car? Your decision isn't do I use rideshare because you have to, your decision is about whatever the negative cash flow is and the car costs money. So you can say this problem, our question is, is it worth it buying a car in, e in order to save all that rideshare costs? You want to make it really, really clear in here, all right? So if you're not sure about your statement, you know, come talk to me and we'll make sure it's worded in a way that whoever's reading this can <coughs> understand it, all right? And then what we're going to do is put in organization of the spreadsheet. And we're going to put some hyperlinks in there. I don't know if y'all use hyperlinks, but I'm a huge, huge fan of hyperlinks. I think I told you I have a spreadsheet that's just hundreds of sheets. And it's so hard to get around that thing. But I have hyperlinks. I can jump really quick and jump back really fast. All right, so what are we going to have in there? So we're going to have the very first page is going to be our assumptions. You want a page of assumptions, and I'm very picky on this, organize it so it's very, very logical. I'll show you how to organize this problem. You can do something similar. I have students that will do their assumptions like sums here, sums, you know, sums in the corner over here, and it's like, where is all this stuff? Why do you have, you know, you've got to make it very, very, very organized. Um, you might have a support sheet for your assumptions. Let's say you're trying to come up with an inflation rate on something. So you go out to the Department of Labor Statistics and you get an inflation rate for whatever you're looking at. Maybe if you're doing the solar project and you want to know what has 
electricity price inflation been in the last 50 years. So you have a separate sheet that does that. At the very bottom, you get your assumption, and then you feed that back into your assumptions page. That's perfectly fine. So you can have supporting documents for your assumptions, but your assumptions need to be very crisp, very clean, very organized. After the assumptions, we're going to then do the base case. So by the base case, you think there's a 50% chance the assumptions will be higher than this and a 50% chance they'll be lower than that. That's your base case. It's that one right in the middle. We're then going to do a best case and a worst case. I usually think in terms of 90%. Your best and worst case, 90% of the time you expect your assumptions to be between you know, your best case and worst case. Most people are overly optimistic, and so your 90% is probably not wide enough, and your downside is probably not bad enough. So, you know, always think that it could be worse. And then one thing I'm going to require for this is a break-even. You need to be thinking about that because for break-even, you have to pick one of your assumptions at least, maybe two or three of your assumptions. One of your assumptions that you're going to run an analysis to say, what was this assumption need to be so this project makes sense? So if you're doing the Airbnb, that's I would guess would probably be your vacancy rate. How often would this thing sit un unrented out? If that comes out to be break even 2%, um, you're probably not going to work. <laughs> Unlikely you're going to have that thing rented out 98% of the time. If it comes out a vacancy rate of 80%, you're probably okay. If you only have to rent it out 20% of the time, you know, that gives you some sense. The break even might be between the best and worst case. Or the break even may be lower than the worst case. Then you feel really, really good. My worst case is 20%. The break even is 16. So this project makes a lot of sense because you know my work, my break even is below my worst case scenario. So it's going to help you with that. I've seen several projects where the break even itself was a deciding factor. I remember we had one project where they're trying to decide whether to buy or lease uh, personal computers, and the way IBM set up the lease, they made it so that the worst case scenario, we were still way, way better off. So what I did on a break even is I asked them, how much could you resell these PC for in five years? What's your worst case? And when I gave them that number, they said, there's no way we can resell those computers with that price. Let's just lease them from IBM. So, you know, so that can be really, really insightful. And then you might move this up, and I'm going to put it at the end for right now. You're going to have a summary table. Maybe charts for this, for this particular case, the table works the best, probably for yours as well. You might have some char summary charts that you can build in at the end, and that can be good as well. But those are the main things. So let's add these sheets. So click on the first one and just add assumptions. And just add sheets with everything. The next one is the base case. Then best case. Worst case, break even, and the summary type. Everybody with me so far? All right, and we're going to hyperlink these. Now, hyperlinking is overkill for this spreadsheet because it's very simple. But I want you to at least be thinking hyperlinking. So on assumptions, I don't know you how to, you know how to hyperlink on the word assumptions. At A13, right click. You see the hyperlink at the very bottom. Again, your Mac may be a little different. So on a Mac, if you're not seeing this, let me know. Any Isabella, do you have hyperlink on yours? Or you see that? So click on hyperlink, and we want to hyperlink it in this document. That's that second bullet. And you just want to click on assumption. See how that works? So you want to hyperlink. In that document? I'm sorry? Yeah, you want to make sure you place it in this document. And then we'll bring up all the sheets you have. And we're just going to link it to cell A1. And you click OK. And so now you have your assumptions set up. And when you click on that, it goes to your assumptions page. And we might hyperlink back. We're probably going to hyperlink everything back to the the uh, assumptions page because you probably want to go back to the assumptions page, not to the, the, the introductory page. Same thing. So do that with everything else. Hyperlink to the base case. Hyperlink to the base, best case. 
hyperlink to the worst case, hyperlink to the break even, and hyperlink to the summary table. Now this, this gets really powerful if you have a spreadsheet. I know in the investment society we have spreadsheets that might go <coughs> several hundred columns. And on an introductory page, we'll say we're we're looking at we're looking at statistics based on asset turnover. And you have a hyperlink that goes to those columns, so you can get right to them. You have a hyperlink that goes right to the margin columns, so you don't have to go pay column by column by column trying to look for everything. So it's a really powerful way to organize your spreadsheet. All right, you can pretty this up however you want to. You know, um, I'm more concerned about your case than this particular um, uh, Excel application. But you know, find ways to make it make it look nice, especially if you're going to take your Excel from your team and put it on LinkedIn as an example of your work. You know, human resources look at it first. Make it pretty and exciting because they're probably not going to get into the details of it. They're going to look and say, wow, this is a really impressive looking spreadsheet. So, you know, um, all right, want to name it. All right, questions up to there. All right, now the most important thing is the assumptions. So we'll go to the assumptions page. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the assumption page as is. I'm not going to hyperlink back to the intro because I doubt we'll be going back to the intro. So we're going to put links on the other ones to go back to the assumptions because that's we want to be able to flip back. All right, so the, on the assumptions, you got to think very carefully before you build your spreadsheet whether you want to go across the page or down the page. I'm going to go down the page with my best and worst across the page. So... Um, I'm going to go down to B3, try to be the exact same cell I'm in, all right? In B3, I'm going to put base case, C3, best case, D, worst case. And you can't do break even because that's something we have to actually calculate. And why don't you go up and select everything and let's make our columns, let's make them 15. So give us some good column widths, all right? And then pretty them up, bold. You know, make, make it look nice. My favorite color is blue, so everything I do is blue, but whatever you like, you know, color-wise, is fine. How do you expand the Yeah, you just click on the whole thing and click right-click on one of them and just tell it column width. And 15 is a pretty good one for what we're doing. All right, so here you've got to really organize your assumptions. So you may have, on some, your cases are more complicated than this. If your assumptions are in categories, then keep them in the categories as you go down. Um, so and, oh, one thing I forgot to add, on, in E3, I'm going to add the word source. You want to, as much as impossible, everything in Excel should be self-explanatory. So, so here's where you could hyperlink. Let's say one of your sources is you went to the Department of Labor, and so you have another sheet that has your CPI assumption, your, your inflation assumption. You could link to that sheet, and then that sheet would have everything. So when someone's like, how did you get that assumption? There's a hyperlink if there's another spreadsheet, or there's a link to a web page or something that tells you how you got there. Okay. And you can link to other spreadsheets as well. It gets a little dangerous because they may not be where you thought they were. But make sure you document your source. Um, all right, so what's the first, everybody with me so far? Y'all got like this, the blue and the white, I don't care about on this project, but just. All right, so let's, let's look at our assumptions. Our first assumptions is how many of these transactions do we get a year? 80,000. So it's 80,000, so I'm going to set that up. I don't have to type it as lengthy there, but transactions per year. My base case is 80,000 assumptions, that's 80,000. You can, we can expand and contract this, the columns that you need. We don't have a base and worst case on this, so we don't have to do that. My source, I'm just going to make it up. My source is going to be USAA PNC cash management, whatever you want to say. That actually was my source. And they obviously knew that. 
the lady who runs that department, she knows the stuff. She could have told you if you saw her in a hallway, she'd say, oh, we do 83,632 a year. She would have known it exactly. So I got that number from her. All right. You notice my 80,000, that's not dollars, it's things. So format every cell so that it is what it is. If it's percent, so it is a percent. If it's dollars, so it is dollars. If the pennies are important, then go out two decimal places. If the pennies are not important, don't go out two decimal places. Don't show more precision than you have in your project, all right? So 80,000, nice round number, that's, that's good enough. All right, everybody got so far on that? All right, what's the next assumption? How many transactions can one employee do in a year? That's 20,000. How many employees do you think this department has? Well, they, oh, they have 80, so. 80 and 20, so they have four employees, all right? So transactions per employee, and that's 20,000. Again, I'm going to format it, and that comes from the exact same source. I can just copy that down. Keep widening out A if we need to. Everybody with me so far? All right. Oh, and watch the spelling. Spell check at the end. All right. What's the next assumption? That 80,000 is going to grow at some rate. 4%. All right, so row in transactions, 0 0.04, and then I'm going to convert that to a percent. On percents, I usually go two decimal places. Just, I just think it looks nicer, but you don't have to. You could do it without the decimals. This, again, comes from most, most of my assumptions came from the cash management department, so there's nothing, there's not a lot of sources here. <laughs> That's going to be very, very important. Um, that's actually a number that five years from now might be really important because someone might want to come back and see how good of a job you do on this project. You may find out the growth rate was actually 2% or 8% and you might want to come back and actually, we'll talk about that, actually grading the project management people, how good of a job they do in setting up assumptions. All right, so all of these are base case. I don't have any best. We're going to use the same assumptions for all three. You don't have to copy them over and show them all three. My, you know, it's, it's up to you how you do it. My approach is if it's only in the base case, it applies to all of them. It's only when I'm going to make a difference that, that it would change. So the next assumption is real important. When we talk to Check Free, the firm that's going to automate these for us, they can't get 100% of them to automate because some people just really set up their accounts really badly. So here we do have some assumptions. This is the most important assumption in this project is how many of these 80,000 can we actually automate? Because we know we can't eliminate 100% of them. So the best case was 90, base case is 70, and worst case is 50. Huh? I understand the expected growth in transaction per employee, but why isn't like transaction per year going to change? Wouldn't you think, like, oh, we had a lot of transactions this year, or is that like not something? Well, the growth in transactions is, is the 80,000, not the 20. All right. So we're going to assume they can only do 20,000 forever and ever and ever. Yeah. They're not going to get better at it, not going to get worse at it. So the 4% only applies to the 80,000, not to the employees. Mm -hmm. All right, so percent automated. Right, the base case was 70%, the best case was 90%, and the worst case was 50%. Actually here, I don't want to use two decimal places there, so it kind of depends, you know, I just look at how it looks, so. All right, so here, I got to document, so here's where you got to document quite a bit, you might reference to another sheet, but here I need to document not just the source, but the source for the different cases. So I'm going to say base case is the average of references 
best case is from vendor and worst case was the lowest from references. So if someone comes in and says, how did you get those ranges? It's like I had a process and you're going to have to do this. And this is really, really important in your project. How did you come up with these numbers? You have to have some basis. You can't just pull numbers out of thin air. So you have to have some basis. For, first, you got to decide as a group, what are you going to do an, uh, the um, uh, sensitivity analysis on? And then once you decide what you do the sensitivity analysis on, you got to figure out what that range is going to be, and you have to have some basis for that. So base case is the average. So I called 10, 10 companies that had done this. And I asked them, what was your conversion rate? I got those down, and the average of that was 70%. The vendor said they could convert 90%, but I don't trust them because they really want to do this. We're the ones spending all the money because we're the ones building the software. They've already built the software. It's not going to cost them anything. So we're the ones spending the money. They're like, yeah, yeah, y'all should do this. So they have an incentive to inflate the number. And in worst case, I called all the references. The 10 of them, one was down at 50%. I could have called one reference and they gave up and the project didn't do it. I'll, you know, I have to say, am I going to have my worst case be 0%? Probably not. But you, know, you have to decide that, right? It's a very subjective thing. But it's an acknowledgement that we don't know everything with certainty. So you need to have that in there, have it documented. Questions up to there? All right, what's our next assumption? How much are we paying these employees? So base salary is 50000 <coughs> This is a dollar amount, so I'm going to hit the dollar amount, and I'm not going to show uh, decimals. This is going to come from USA Payroll. In fact, at USA, we had tables that you could use. I don't know what USA does now, but when I was there, they had what they called grades. So I started off, I think, at grade 18, and they you get 22, I can remember, and you get promoted to 24, 26. So payroll provides these tables, say if they're grade, if they're grade 18 employees, this is their pay. So that was fairly straightforward. 50,000. Our next assumption is compensation. So you have your salary and then you have additional compensation. I'm going to call them benefits. And I'm going to say percentage of salaries, because that's how it's given to me. So how much more do we pay these workers over and above their salary? An extra 15%. So the 50000 there's their base pay, it's an extra 50%, 15%. So that's a percent, so I'm going to put that as a percent. And again, that comes from, from payroll. It's things like their, pen, their pension plan, which they don't have anymore, their 401k plan, uh, health care. It's things that if these employees were, their jobs are eliminated, we would save that money. But you have to ask that question. Is there anything in that 15% that wouldn't go away? And so you have to be real careful on that. But this is the official number USA used. The next is not an assumption. We're just going to stick it in there so we know that we considered it. And that are those allocated costs for rent and phone and computer. So I'm just going to call it allocated per employee. And that's $500. These are costs that I went and researched and discovered they would probably still have to be covered by someone else if these employees were let go. So I'm going to get that from... Um, USA CFO, and then I'm going to put in all quotes, not used in this analysis. So again, why would I put something in here that I'm not using? So you pull the spreadsheet up three months from now, what's the first thing your boss asks? Does this include indirect costs? And what do you say? No, the indirect costs were $500 per employee, but we did not use it in this analysis. Right, so you might want to bold that or highlight it or something so that you know you didn't use it. But now you know you didn't use it because you put it in your spreadsheet. So that's really, really good to do. So we won't ever use this 500 ever again. That's the only place we have it. Everybody with me so far? 
I see on the instructor survey how many, he goes too fast, he goes too fast. All right, so compensation, this 50,000, we're not gonna keep paying these people 50,000 every single year. So there's gonna be some raise. It will be higher than CPI, higher than inflation because USA does pay their employees a little bit faster because they're getting promoted, they're, you know, they're in, so the official number is 5%. So pay inflation or whatever you wanna call it. 5%. And this comes from USAA CFO. It's part of the forecasting process. We had an official number every year, and CFO would just give it to us. Are you going to inflate the benefits as well? Well, well so, yeah. Since benefits are percentage of salary, when we inflate salary, it all make it all make big in there. Yeah. So there's pay inflation. And then the last, well, almost last thing, is how much is it going to cost to develop this software? And they say it's $565,000. So we're going to do software development. What did I just say? I can't remember. 565. It's a dollar amount, so make sure there's a dollar there. Here comes, this comes from USAA Information Systems. All right, so this one was a problem for me. That $565,000 probably has allocated costs in it. But we don't know what it is. So it probably is not really costing us that much. There's probably maybe only 300,000. That's really people's time. But I figure if the project makes sense with the 565, it's going to make even more sense if I fix this number. So the only time I'll worry about that if the project is, doesn't make sense by like 10,000, 15,000, I can go back and say, you know what? Some of that 565 is probably not a true cost. It's probably some of the CEO, the investment systems, information systems time or whatever. But right now I'm just going to use it. Uh, they had an official number they would give you and they would just put it. So we'll use it. It's sim simpler to do that, but it, it is important to consider. All right, so you have all of your assumptions in there. Anything we're missing? There was that last one. What is the very last one? Cost of capital. Cost of capital. So in cost of capital, for your projects, I recommend you just use 5%. We're going to talk, we're going to talk about cost of capital much later. By the time we talk about it, it'll be just too late for you to put it in your case. So 5% is fine. For here, I'm using 7%. And... At USA, you just you get that from USA CFO. It was not seven percent. USA's cost of capital is like three point two percent, much much lower. But I'm using seven in this case. Okay, so we've got everything we need. Are y'all visualizing now how you're going to do your case? And do you see why it's extremely important you think about this before you start? I don't know how many cases I've seen it get, doesn't get set up well, and then they got this mess to deal with, and they can't copy things over, or they can't edit because it's all set up incorrectly. So you could go, I, I went down the page, you could be going across and, you know, it's, and have your base case, worst case over here. Most, most cases have so many line items, it's easier to have a long list going down the page than across the page, so it probably makes more sense. But you decide how to do that, but think about it before you get to this next stage. So you want to stop and think about this before you get to the base case. Are we ready to do base case? Anybody behind? All right. <coughs> Base case is the second most important thing you do after the assumptions because if you get the base case set up, the best case, worst case, and break even take you like less than one minute. <laughs> They're really, really simple, but you got to get the base case. So don't, in fact, we're, I'm going to meet with y'all uh, late March, early April on this. I don't want you to have done the worst and best case yet. I want you to make sure your base case is correct because if it's correct, the rest of it's really, really simple. All right? So here I'm going to put the, the base, base case. I'm on a base case. I'm going to do return to assumptions at the top. And how would I hyperlink that? Hyperlink to the assumptions page. So I can flip back and forth. Um, if you wanted to, you could actually hyperlink up here if you wanted. I, I think I'll do that. You, however fancy you want to get. It messes up the color, but that's all right. All right, so there I got my assumptions. All right, so 
here's the columns you're going to use. The first one is time. And so here's what we're going to do on time. This is really, really unusual. <clears throat> what we're going to do on time, we're going to start off with equal today, open parentheses, close parentheses. And that will give us today. So every time you bring up this spreadsheet, it's going to change, going to change that date. And then I want you to use this approach. We're going to use what's called, you don't need this in your spreadsheet, but um, we're going to use what's called the half year convention. It's a really easy way to get analysis in. So if we do this project, we're going to save salaries throughout the entire year. But we need to know actually when do we save the money. So we could put 250 days in there and spread it over, but that's a lot of work. We could have it all be uh, March 5th, 2021, but if we do that, Excel's gonna assume you saved it all on March 5th, like you didn't pay your employees until March 5th. So that's an extreme case. So what we're gonna do is assume that we save all the salaries in six months from now. We're just gonna split the difference. We know we're gonna save some of the salaries throughout the year, but if we assume we save them all exactly in a half year, it's as if we spread it out through the entire year. Does that make sense? It's called a half year in convention. So what is a half year from now? How many days is that? So a year is 365. What's half of 365? 180, 183, 182. So let's try 183 because it's, well, I guess it's, no, 182 probably works. So I don't care. 182, 183, either one is, is fine. You don't have to get... I am a little picky on, uh, on leap year that if this is 9-3-2020, guess what you want the next one to be? 9-3-2021. So how do we get this to be 9-3-2021? What do we add? I'm sorry, how did you do the other thing? All right, so here, here I just I did the date. Here. I did the date plus 182. So what do you think I would do the next one? Plus 365. Plus 365 on less leap year than it's 366. Yeah, but we already passed the leap year, so that was back in February. All right. Does this help to have the formulas over here? I'm hoping that reduces y'all's. Can you go back to sell the water? All right, so what do we do with the next year? You can just copy it down. Just copy it down and copy it down one more time. There's where you need 366. Y'all see what I mean by 366? We finally got to a leap year. So here, you just, you just keep copying them down. So make sure you're in the exact same row, rows and columns I'm in. A5 is the title and then A6 all the way down is everything else. Uh, oh, Excel is picking time. Don't don't type don't type this. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't need that. Just type the stuff next to it. Who has who has nine three twenty four right there? Anybody? Most of y'all. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move this, this down here. All right, the next one is we're going to start building this. We, this. This will vary. Your project's going to be very, very different. You can still use this template. The way I like to do it is start with the calculation of benefits. So on this project, we'll have different columns. You might have benefits. You might have five or six columns of benefits five or six columns of costs, and then your initial costs, so the benefits. The first thing we've got to do is figure out transactions, total transactions. Again, let's click on the total and let's make it, let's make the column width 20 on this, all right? So we have a little bit of room there. 
All right, how many transactions will we do exactly today? Well, none. Today is the start of the project. So how many transactions will we do over the next year? What was our assumption there? 80,000. So what do we need to do? If you type 80,000 here, I will count off like 137%. <laughs> so you'll get a really bad grade. So what do we want to do there? Yeah, equal and go back to the assumptions and click on that 80,000. Why do we want to do that? Well, what if cash management calls you and says, you know, it's, we're really doing 90,000. You only have to change one place. You don't have to go find where it is. So you should not have any, should not have any key numbers anywhere on this, on this sheet. It should all be referencing something else. Okay. Why is it not 40? It's like, it's half a year. So yeah, so the half year is just for the discounting process. So that's a good question. So you want to treat these as full years when you put the numbers in. All this is doing is helping you with the discounting process. This is really not time, it's really our N. It's an assumption. So this, this 9-3 is saying everything that happens from 3-5-2020 through 3-4-2021. And that's just the midpoint. Okay? It is a little confusing, but that you want full year. Right? Because what's the mid-year mid convention going to do? It's going to assume 40,000 of these happened before 9-3 and 40,000 happened after 9-3. The difference. That's a good question. Now, how many transactions will they do in 2021? Same. No, 80 times the 4%. Yeah, 80,000 times 1 plus the growth rate. What's the growth rate? 4%. What do we need to do with that 4%? Because so that's the growth. You need to hit that F4 or Command 4 to lock it in. The dollar sign, so know how the dollar sign works. It should be easy if you've got yours in the exact same cells I have mine. If anyone's not in the same cells, you're, you're going to have some issues. Should we lock in the assumption, the initial assumption as well? We don't need to because we're only going to refer to 80,000 once. Right. And the next year, you're going to refer to the 80,000 on this sheet and then multiply by 1 plus the growth rate. All of your projects will have something like this where you're taking the previous year times one plus an assumption. All of your projects will have that. Make sure you have the parentheses in the right place. And then you can just copy it down. Well, don't go all the way in. You don't have that other stuff. Then you just copy it down. Mine say reference. Well, if it says reference, then you hit something, something wrong somewhere. No, you got you to put it. Does anybody have 93,589? All right. Looks like we got about a fourth of the class. Anybody else? <laughs> Looking good. Uh huh. And, why, and we're doing four years because. I'm doing five years because what the project said. All right. You go at the very bottom, they said to go out five years. You've got to decide. It really depends. So the project that's doing the, uh, the solar might have to go out 25 years. So the rule is how long will a solar panel last? About 25 years, so you need to go out 25 years. Once you get the second year set up, most projects you just keep copying down. If you need to go 50 years, 100 years, it's just really easy to just keep copying. If you're doing the car, then you've got to ask how long will the car last? If you think the car lasts seven years, then go seven years. Okay, so how many years you do depends on really the life of whatever it is you're building. Okay, I forget the other things, the digitization, the library, no, it, it's hard to say. Um, maybe you go change. It depends. At some point, they're going to have to do it again, or something's going to change. So you say, what's the real? So we're thinking about useful life. Here, the useful life is much more than five years. But essentially, we're saying, let's go five years. If it makes sense in five years, that's good. If we have to go 20 years to get this thing to work, then it's probably not worth it to do it. All right. Everybody okay there? All right. I'm going to I'm going to move these down here at the bottom. So you just have the first two rows there. All right, then we want to do transactions converted. So how many of these transactions will we convert? Oh, wait, let me, let me, uh, let's, let's, uh, gosh, it doesn't matter which order I go in. Let me think about that. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, so we're doing the base case. How many of these transactions will we convert? 
80,000 times, we go back to our assumptions, 70%, you do have to lock that one in. And you get 56,000, again, I, 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 I really hate spreadsheets that look like this. Give me good, good formatting, okay? Commas or whatever. It's, it's, it's. And that we can actually just copy down. Does it make a difference the equal sign and then the plus sign? I use the equal sign because it saves me a step. I, I use the plus sign, I'm sorry. Because the plus sign's over here and equal sign's up there. You get the same answer. Either way. This is a relic for but for both. Like you put you don't, I, I get both because anytime you use the plus sign, Bill Gates puts the equal sign in there. It's him doing oh, okay. that. It's not me. Okay. Yeah, it's his fault. I shouldn't have this Bill Gates on YouTube, but that's all right. He's going to hire he's going to hire a guard to protect him from me. Um, so anytime I put the formula there and I don't put it anywhere else, you're just you're just copying it down. All right. So our assumptions is 70% get converted. So if we do this project, we should eliminate 56,000 transactions. There's probably more than one way we could do this, but um, this will work. So the next one is FTEs saved. You all remember what an FTE is? No. It's a full-time equivalent. So a full-time person can do 20,000 of these transactions, but she may not have full-time employees. She may not have four people in this department. She may have eight people in this department, but they're each working half-time. So we, we, we're not counting bodies. We're counting a full-time person. So how many transactions, if we save 56,000, how many people are we going to save? Each person does how many? 20,000. 20, so we'll take the 56,000 and do what? Divide it by 20,000. Again, we've got to lock that in. So I'm going to go out two decimal places here. Now here's, if, if you look at this, that 2.8 is 2.8, but it Why might... Oh, she can. She, oh, it, she can. She has, the way Carol runs her department, she has 50 people, some work 10 hours, some work 20 hours. She can very easily go 2.8, yeah. This is a debate. Some accountants say, hey, if it's 2.8, you got to go 2. Mm -hmm. If it's a professional area where you have accountants that almost are all full-time jobs, then, yeah, you may have to say that's only 2. One thing really important with your case, though, don't use the round function. You're going to see why when we get to the break-even. All right, so... All right, this one we can copy down as well. So you're just taking the number of transactions we're going to convert, because we don't have to do those anymore, divided by how many each person can do, and it saves us 2.8 people. You'll notice in the very last column, it's actually 3.275639, but that's okay. Just leave it in there. So you probably won't save exactly that number of people, but it's going to be close enough. If you, if you round it, the break-even can't find an answer and it messes up the whole spreadsheet. So just leave that there. All right, questions on that? All right. Then we're going to put... Now here you have a choice. I'm going to put salaries. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put total compensation for FTE. So how much are we paying each one of these people? The salary, and how do we handle the 15 percent? We're going to do times one plus the 15 percent. And you don't really need to lock that in. You'll see why in a second. It's a dollar, so put the dollar. So you can see why it's so important to put the dollar there. It's really close to this 56,000, but this 56,000 is not dollars, it's things. So you want to make sure you display what it is. So we're going to save 2.8 people, and each one of them makes 57,500. Uh, you multiply times one plus the percent. Yeah, nine. The B9 is is the 15%. So you're taking is the 50,000. So you're taking $50,000 times 1 plus 15%. Did you, lock in anything for that one? you don't need lock in here. You'll see why on the next 
We're going to increase this by the payroll increase, but we don't. We only need the fifty-seven thousand one time. And you don't, it doesn't have to do with FTE save. Well, mean? we're going to see that two point eight times fifty-seven five is exactly what we're saving. Okay. All right. All right. So, how much would our compensation be next year? It'd be the fifty-seven five. 57,500 times one plus our payroll increase. Where's the payroll increase? The 5%. That one you do have to lock in. And I don't like going out on pennies on something like this. Um, so you have to decide. Like on FTEs, the 2.80 is actually important. You have to decide what to show your boss, but on, on dollar amounts like this, I don't like going out the pennies just because I think it implies a precision that's just not there. So I really don't think we're going to pay them exactly 60 or well. I really don't think we're going to pay them 61 cents there. I just don't, you know, surrounding's fine. All right, y'all see my method. If it if I don't repeat it, it means you just copy it down. All right. So this one, we're getting a little trickier here by following that. Anybody got the 69,892? Check one All right. But why is it that we multiply first the inflation and then the 15%? Well, the 15% is included in there, so we're increasing both the salary and the, and the pension and all the other stuff all together by 5%. So everything is increasing 5%. So it's all, all included. That was a question Abraham was talking about. But yeah, you, you. Now, if you wanted to, you could break them into different columns. It's, it's okay. It's not wrong to do that. It's just if you can somehow put it together like this, it's just a lot easier. Okay. USA, they think in terms of total compensation, so it, it makes sense to put there. All right, and so here we're going to have compensation saved. So how much do we save in the first year? Yeah. 2.8 people times 57,000 will save 161,000. And this one you can just copy down. Works all the way down. So all of your projects somewhere, you'll be inflating something. So let's say you're doing a solar project and you're talking about energy you're saving from CPS. CPS has inflation. They're going to charge more in three years than they do today. You need to have that somewhere in your assumption. Um, if you're doing the um, buy a car or do shared ride, <laughs> gasoline prices will increase. So you got to put that inflation in there. Especially, I saw gasoline prices like at 185 or something. So it's like crazy how cheap gas is right now. So it's probably going to increase some. <laughs> Now, there, are there any other savings in, in there? That's about all we were given, isn't it? Compensation. We're not going to do anything with the $500 in direct costs. We just have that documented. So there's our, there's our total compensation. Again, you can pretty this up. Um, you know, you can bold it and center it and all those kind of things. On the benefits, I do like bring it all together. Use the Alt HMC. You know, and fancy that up. What color should benefits be? Green. Green, right? However you want to do it, I'm more concerned about your actual team project making this look nice. The, remember, on your team project, the Excel is a big part of the grades. Uh, my columns are not wide enough, so if you want to shorten titles, total comp. Y'all know the abbreviation for transactions? It's the same as the state of Texas. <laughs> so TX is the abbreviation for transactions. So if you got too many letters, you know, you can, you can shorten stuff down. That's fine. I don't mind that. All right. And then we're going to come to cost. Any questions? How many of y'all have 228,937? Is that almost everybody? Anybody who doesn't? Are you close or is it? A serious problem. 
You have to turn in your own work on Excel apps. You can have someone help you if you need help, but you've got to do your own work. All right, so the costs. We've only really been given one cost, so we're going to put that in there, and that's software development. I'm going to put a, a column in there for other costs. It's nothing going to, nothing's going to be in there because we don't have any other costs. For your project, you might have three or four columns on the costs. So if you're doing the buy the car versus um, ride share, then your benefits is all that ride sharing costs that you're saving. Your cost is going to be the cost of maintaining the car, gasoline, insurance, maintenance. All right, so it all depends on how you set up your project. So where does the software development cost happen? Right at time zero, right? So at time zero, that's the only thing you're going to have on this line six is that initial cost. So if you're doing the car versus ride share, it's going to be the cost of that car. Remember, whatever your project is, you assume you pay it all up front with cash. I know if you do a car, you're going to buy it on credit, but... You assume for CBA projects, you assume you all pay it all up front with cash. Then if the project makes sense, then you decide how you're going to finance it. But we don't want to mix financing decisions with cost-benefit analysis. Right? I'm not saying that because I'm simplifying it for the class. I'm saying that's true even in real life. All right, so here you got a decision to make. I don't care which way you do it. My preference is if it's a cost, I show it as a negative number. If it's a benefit, I a positive. You can show your costs as positive numbers and just make sure you subtract them on the end. But if, to me, if it's a cost, I'm going to show it as a negative number. That's 565. It's a dollar amount. It's the only thing I have. I don't have any other costs anywhere else. Just be consistent. If you show your initial cost as a negative number, show your other costs as a negative number. I like that because then we can just sum across. We don't have to use pluses and minuses. So we don't have any other costs, so I'll pretty that up. The cost of capital? Well, we'll use that later. Yeah, you'll see we'll use that later. All right, so I'm going to cost. What color should cost be? Definitely red. And here you see why I don't use the equal sign at all, because you don't need it. You just hit the minus sign, and Bill Gates will put this equal sign in there. So it's just you don't want to get rid of those extra steps. All right, and here we're going to, our last column is going to be the net cash flows. We'll make that blue, I guess. I don't really care. So what are our net cash flows? We go over and we get the, the compensation saved plus the development cost. If you wanted to, you could have a, a summary chart for all your costs, like I did here. You know, it's up, it's up to you how you do it. We don't have any other costs, so I'm just ignoring that cell. So, so we have software development and your And then your total savings, compensation save, column F. And then that you can just copy down. And it should just have... Your net cash flows, that's where you're going to do all your calculations around this net cash flow. Anybody have 228, 937? All right. Does this look like a good project? You spend $565,000 and you get $967,000 in benefits. It looks like it's probably pretty good. We'll see. Did you fix the one Which one was that? You don't need to. Okay. You only have to fix it if you're going to copy it to the place. That's the only place we're using it, so we don't we don't need to. All right. So I'm going to go down to let's go down to um, H14. And we'll do summary. Statistics. So we're going to use only three things in this class. The notes have two or three other things in there. We're only going to use three things. The most important one is net present value. We're going to do internal rate of return. And then we're going to do discounted payback. 
Those are the three we're going to use. This kind of payback's the hardest one. I'm assuming you're all going to take this final on a computer, so I want you to learn the Excel functions. If you do it by hand, it's a lot of calculations, but if you do it in the calculator and on the computer, it's a lot easier. All right. So what is net present value? Net present value is going to say, okay, it cost me $565. That's $565 in today's dollars, so there's no discounting there. I get $161,000 over the next year, but that's going to be worth less than $161,000 in today's dollars. So we're going to take that and discount it back. We're going to discount it using an N of 0.5. If I use an N of 1, it means we got all that savings exactly in one year, but we know we're spread out throughout the year, so we use 0.5. And Abram's question, that 165 is the entire year, but our N is, is 0.5. So we have kind of a combination of things. All right. The 228, that's a lot of savings, but it's five years out, so we're going to discount that by five years. So it's really going to bring it down, or by four and a half years. So let's do, let me show you this. It's a really great function. Equal XNPV. And then Bill Gates, nice thing on the exam, Bill Gates tells you exactly what to do. It's like you're cheating using Bill Gates. Bill Gates is sitting next to you and he's got his notes open. So, what's the first thing it asks for? Rate. rate. Where is our rate? It's on our assumptions page, isn't it? The 7%. Where are our values? That's where your net cash flows are. Wait. There's our values. And then where are our dates? Yeah, we put them in that first column. Close parentheses and we'll get our net present value. I'm going to put a dollar amount on that. $245. Who's going to be the first to get $245,933? Oh, you already got it. Oh, okay, good. So is it just an opinion if we leave the decimals or not? Yeah, it's up to you, but, but um, and especially on something like this, I don't like showing decimals, especially the summary. It just, um, it, 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 is, it is a call. There's, there's some of them just like, it looks strange to have decimals. De definitely don't have it. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can un Un undo this one. <laughs> yeah, if you if you turn in like this, hope I will count off for something like that. I hate I hate that. <laughs> this looks so horrible to me. So yeah, y'all see. I mean, you can't even tell what it is. Is that two million? Is that two hundred forty? You, you just can't tell. So definitely on something like that, you, you definitely want to. But you know, if you have two decimals or not, that doesn't matter. All right, so there's a net present value. Mine is at 964. I did like the exact same thing. I don't know what it's Well, you got 964. You probably don't have the 565 in your range. So make sure that's in your range. All right. Now we're going to do the IRR. All right, let me tell you, explain what the IRR is. We'll get into it more when we get through the notes. Our discount rate is 7% and we got a present value of 245. What the IRR says is, what does that discount rate need to be so that 245 goes to zero? All right, so it's like the true return on the project. So again, Bill Gates is gonna do all the work and do equal X I R R. It asks for the value values, you remember where those are? Same thing again up here. Comma, what does he ask for next? The dates, so go grab the dates. And what was the last thing? We don't need the last thing. So you just need the dates. You don't need the guess. He can do it without the guess. And what format do we use for this? A percent. And here I would just use one decimal place. Twenty-four percent. Does that sound like a good return? really good to me, especially when the 10-year treasury is below 1% uh, today. It's got a crazy first time in history. <coughs> so what that's saying is like, 
investing in this project is the equivalent of getting a 24% return on it, it has one major flaw, but yeah, it is essentially you're making 24% of this project. So total return would be the net present value plus the 565. The total return. What do you mean total return? Like the total uh, revenues per cent. Would be the 245 plus the 565? No, the, the 245 includes that 565. It's already been subtracted out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it's in their range. So, yeah, that's the net number. This project is very popular. In fact, when I finished doing the analysis on their project, I called the head of cash management and said, start the project right now. <laughs> this project, so obviously, we need to do it. You know, I'll sign any papers you need. Let's get it through, get the committee, and let's just go. This is a really important project. So, yeah, it was a very obvious one. All right. We can't do payback yet, but uh, I'm going to move these two formulas down here. And we're going to use some logic, some Excel logic. We're not going to be able to finish this today, so you'll have to just get started with it. Uh, I was hoping to get the base cake built, but we probably won't be able to today. So we'll spend some time. Boy, it's kind of bad to have spring break in the middle of this. So let, we're going to build some logic. Our logic is going to be equal if. If the, if the net present value is greater than zero, comma, we're going to accept the project, comma, we're going to reject the project. That's the accept, reject decision. If net present value is greater than zero, you accept the project, otherwise you reject. So if 245, 933, if that's greater than zero, we accept a project. If it's less than zero, we reject the project. You do have to build this on the exam, so make sure you know, because I, I need to know that you understand the accept reject criteria. For net present value, it's simple. Greater than zero is good. If the, if the net present value is greater than zero, doing this project will increase the value of the firm. Can we, can so, we use notes on the exam? No. Oh, never notes. Why would you use notes? All right, I'll, I'll, we're going to do the same thing for IR. If IRR is greater than what? If the internal rate of return is greater than our cost of capital, we accept. Where is our cost of capital? It's on the assumptions page, 7%. If that's the case, we accept. Otherwise, we reject. All right, so in this case, our IRR is 24%, our cost of capital is 7%, so we accept the project. All right, so you should remember that. The criteria for IRR, if it's greater in cost of capital, we accept the project. And we can test it, right? What if our IRR had been 2%? What happens? We reject the project. What if our net present value had been negative 100,000? We reject, so we're doing that. So, Logic functions are really powerful. They help you. You, know, you don't have to go back and check the spreadsheet. It does everything for you. Okay, so next class we'll start with discounted payback.